it's great to see you all here um, for our Haskins lecture tonight. I'm Pauline Yu, um, president of ACLS, and I'm very pleased to introduce the 2018 Charles Homer Haskins Prize lecturer, Professor Sally Falk Moore. This is the 36th year of the Haskins Prize lecture series, which is named in honor of the first chairman of the American Council of Learned Societies. Each year, the executive committee of the delegates to ACLS selects this lecturer from the many worthy submissions from our uh, community. You'll find a list of previous prize winners in your program. Haskins lecturers are asked to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar, on the motives, the chance determinations, the satisfactions, and the dissatisfactions of the life of learning, and to explore through one's own life the larger institutional life of scholarship. We do not wish the speaker to present the products of one's own scholarly research, but rather to share with other scholars the personal process of a particular lifetime of learning. Professor Moore's lifetime of learning has taken an unusual course for a scholar in the humanities. She began her career shortly after graduating from Columbia Law School, first working for a Wall Street law firm, and then as an attorney assisting in the investigation and prosecution of Nazi war criminals in the Nuremberg trials. Her experience at Nuremberg led her to the humanistic social sciences to wrestle with the problem of how to attribute individual responsibility for the actions of a society. While she may not have found answers in anthropology, she found methods and theories that would help form the foundations of her distinguished scholarly career as a legal anthropologist. As one of the letters nominating Professor Moore for this honor noted, she was a global scholar before anyone had a term for this point of departure. After writing her dissertation, which would become her first book on Inca law, judicial practice, and political institutions, Professor Moore turned her attention to Tanzania, where she conducted field work regularly over the course of more than 40 years. She is a, legal, a leading figure in the field of legal anthropology, whose work has focused on the social and cultural aspects of law, legal professionalism, and the role of law in local, regional, and global processes of social transformation. Professor Moore is, to say the least, a prolific writer, the author or editor of eight books and more than 50 articles. One nomination letter noted that her work speaks to many audiences at once, and she herself has described her approach as eclectic, employing a range of theoretical frameworks and her methodology as hybrid, mobilizing a combination of ethnographic fieldwork and archival and documentary evidence to support her claims. One example of this is her 1986 book, Social Facts and Fabrications, Customary Law on Kilimanjaro's 1880 to 1980, about the changing use of customary law within a particular Chaga lineage group in Northern Tanzania over a hundred year period. The book received glowing reviews in over a dozen academic journals as diverse as American Anthropologist, Contemporary Sociology, the American Historical Review, Law and Society Review, and the Journal of African History, with reviewers calling it ambitious, exciting, innovative, a remarkable achievement, and an outstanding contribution. Professor Moore's inclination to speak to multiple audiences refers not only to her ability to address other scholars across disciplinary boundaries, but also to her, quote, gift for making complex ideas accessible and engaging, unquote, to students and the public. She has taught at the University of Southern California, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, and Yale University, and has been at Harvard University since 1981 where she is appointed as the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Anthropology Emerita, as well as in the law school, and where she's earned a reputation as a legendary teacher, generous mentor, and sought after public speaker. Professor Moore has received dozens of honors and awards and her service to the profession and to the institutions where she has spent her career is considerable. She served many stints as department chair, has participated in numerous boards and committees in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, and was appointed Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences from 1985 to 1989. Among ACLS Learned Societies, Professor Moore has been an active member of the American Anthropological Association, where she served on its board of directors, the Law and Society Association, and the African Studies Association. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
Tonight, we celebrate Sally Falk Moore's achievements as a dedicated member of the profession, stimulating teacher and public speaker, and visionary scholar. As the letter nominating her put it, she is truly an exemplar of wisdom and broad influence in the humanities. We are very grateful for the opportunity to hear her reflections on a lifetime of learning and to be inspired by her personal journey as a scholar. Please join me in welcoming Sally Falk Moore. Thank you, Pauline Yu, for that lovely introduction. And thanks to the ACLS for inviting me to give the Haskins Lecture. Well, where and when does an intellectual autobiography begin? Surely it starts in childhood with the many puzzles the children have to figure out. I'll start at the age of six to 10. At that time, I lived with my father and mother and my younger brother and a governess, who was the most important person in my life. We lived in a spacious New York apartment on the Upper West Side, right across the street from Central Park. Uh, the governess was our constant companion. She slept in the same room with me and my brother. Uh, we, all, we ate all our meals with her in the playroom, and somewhat peripherally, but also living in our household, was a buxom, smiling Czechoslovakian cook who prepared all the family meals. Most of the time, she stayed in her kitchen domain and in her adjacent tiny room. For an anthropologist, perhaps the first thing to note about this assemblage was that not everyone was of the same nationality. The cook was always a European. Our governess was German, but she had been given the task of teaching us to speak French. <laughs> I speak with a slight German accent. <laughs> she had gone to school in Alsace, and she had learned French in school. On ordinary weekdays, the governess took me and my brother to the park every afternoon. My mother never went to the park with us, nor did other mothers we know go with their children. All the children we knew had live-in caretakers, called variously nannies, governesses, fräuleins. Our governess had Thursday afternoon off and all of Sunday. On these days, my mother took us to visit her parents and her sister. But on ordinary days, my mother was a serious art student who spent most of her time at the Art Students League in New York, studying with one mentor or another, or painting in one of their studios. My father was a surgeon, and he seemed to be away at work most of the time. On some Sundays, when he had house calls to make, he would take me and my brother out for a ride in the car, which was supposed to be a great treat. When we were alone, I sometimes took the opportunity to give my brother a punch. <laughs> we got to know our parents well later on when we were teenagers, when we were through with governesses, and then we had graduated to eating our meals in the dining room with our mother and father. When we were young, Saturdays were always a special treat. Every Saturday, the governess took us to the Museum of Natural History. We especially enjoyed seeing the models of Indian villages and the huge totem poles that Franz Boas had brought back to the museum, and the large Indian canoe in the main hall, <laughs> filled with life-size casts of Indians ready to row their boat out to sea. We wanted to visit these villages and wondered if they still existed. We also loved the occasional times during our walks in the summer when Miss Frundner, the governess, stopped into a Catholic church. She would take us with her, hurry in for a few minutes to light some candles, and say a silent prayer. For us, the scene was absolutely awesome, the dark interior of the church tantalizing. We were vaguely aware that we were something called Jewish, but we weren't exposed to any Jewish ceremonial activity. The mystical secret activity in the church was strange and wonderful. For us, every day ended when the governess put us to bed. The governess then told us wonderful stories before putting out the light. Many of the stories were German folk tales, some very much on the model of the Grimm brothers, full of strange magical events and persons. I often thought about the details of the stories and how a little change of fact here and there would have produced a different result. 
what, what if Hansel and Gretel, instead of distributing little bits of bread on their path, put the path full of pebbles instead of crusts of bread? They could easily have found the path and taken it back to retrace their steps. If William Tell's son had refused to let his father aim his bow and arrow at him, perhaps he would not have run any risk at all. I often ask, what if? Our Miss Frinder not only told us stories, but also told us things about her life. We learned that when she lived in Germany, her sister worked at a bakery, and that she didn't want to do that kind of work. She told us that she wanted to travel and see the world. She thought she could make it happen by becoming a governess. The child-minding job she had before she came to our family was in Portugal. She learned Portuguese when she worked there. We asked her to say something in Portuguese and to teach us something that we could say. What she taught us was how to say, give me a kiss. <laughs> I admired her enormously. So the early development of an anthropologist, a multicultural household, an inquiring mind, a fascination with the odd and mystical, and a love for totem poles. <laughs> that was the general picture until we went to school. We were sent to an extraordinary school. The school was a much talked about innovative new institution, which my mother had heard about when she was in college at Columbia. Called the Lincoln School of Teachers College, it was an experimental school funded by the Rockefellers and inspired by the philosophy of John Dewey. Columbia's Teachers College sent its education students to observe our classes and to learn new ways of teaching. We thought they were very peculiar to be watching us. <laughs> Here are a few highlights of the classes that I remember. In the fourth grade, when we learned about ancient Egypt, we were told a lot about how people lived. We learned about camels and deserts. We made small clay bricks and built mini pyramids. We learned about hieroglyphics. But most exciting of all, we made paper out of papyrus reeds. How the school got papyrus and how they knew that we could, how we could process it, I have no idea. But it gave us the feeling that we really understood a lot about ancient civilization. When we moved on to the fifth grade, the theme of our studies was the city itself. The physical plant, the buildings, the firehouses, the trolley cars, the post office, the police station, the harbor, the trucks that brought supplies into the city. We learned also about how maps were made. The teachers told us about poverty in the city. Not that everyone had a place to live or how, as much food as they needed. Many of us had seen the shacks in the park that homeless people built for themselves. We learned about strikes that workers were using to try to get better wages. This would have been around 1934, and I was 10. We were, in fact, in the midst of the Great Depression. Many people were out of work, and others were very poor. The teacher's sympathy for the impoverished was clear. We did not fully understand this. But we got the message that the city was a place where a lot of people lived in very different situations from ours and sometimes took political action. When we were older, early in high school, the class went on a trip to an automobile factory. The repetitiousness of the work on the assembly line made an indelible impression. I did not have to wait for Charlie Chaplin's modern times. I had seen the real thing. Grown-up people doing the same thing over and over and over again all day long. They were not able to talk to each other or to walk around. It seemed awful. I puzzled over the relationships that people had. I saw some of it at home. I understood certainly by the time I was 10 that the governess and the cook were employees of my parents. It was plain to me that my mother could direct the governess and define that, and the cook, and define their tasks, and that they could be dismissed. The help always looked embarrassed when my mother was in an ordering mode. It was clear that they had to obey. Their shoes were not as pretty as my mother's. I thought it was very unfair that they were not as free, nor as well off as my parents, and would only stay with us temporarily. 
There was no doubt that observing the household I grew up in shaped my early fascination with micro-politics and that what I learned in school made me want to understand something about the larger working world. One year in high school, we were taught by a moral, gentle social studies teacher with powerful political views. His name was Henry Fenn. He spoke Chinese, and he had been brought up in China where his parents were missionaries. His indignation about the Japanese invasion of Manchuria was strongly and persuasively communicated to us. We learned about boycotts of Japanese goods. I was determined to participate. I completely stopped wearing Japanese-made silk stockings and wore ugly cotton lyle ones after that time. I felt that I was taking political action in a grown-up way. I was aware of the Spanish Civil War that began when I was 12 and I admire the young American volunteers fighting on the side of leftists against the conservative nationalist government led by Francisco Franco. Outside of school, I was an occasional visitor to the household of my classmate, David Lowenthal, the son of a lawyer who was a well-known Washington lobbyist. The home life of the Lowenthals was very different from that of my family. The parents, Max and Eleanor, always ate dinner with their three children. And most striking was the fact that this happened even when the Lowenthal's had political guests from Max's Washington circle. I was dazzled by these occasional glimpses of important people in public life. So school led to further development of the nascent, the nascent political anthropologist. Delight at making papyrus and pyramids, horror at rote labor, awareness of the micropolitics present in my parents' relationship with their servants, and a burgeoning global consciousness, solidified by dinner at the Lowenthal's, and a commitment to wearing meaningful but ugly stockings. <laughs> when I was about 15 years old, my Lincoln School teachers thought I was ready for college. I had amassed enough high school credits to graduate, largely because I was fluent in French and had a smattering of German. If I were going to college, my parents wanted me living at home where they could watch over me. They feared that I might become present, uh, pregnant in some weekend at Vassar, <laughs> or what, much worse still, become a dancer if I went to Bennington. <laughs> I argued but obeyed, and I went to Barnard College in New York. <clears throat> Barnard's style of lectures and heavy use of textbooks and memorization was a deep disappointment after the Lincoln School. But all was not dreary in my life. It was 1939 and the developing war in Europe was ominous and preoccupying. I made some good friends among my classmates and I could talk with them about what the future might hold for us. And astonishingly, some friends of my parents introduced me to a potential boyfriend, a young lawyer nine years older than I was, Bill Zeck. I saw a lot of him, and the romance lasted my whole college career and beyond. It was during the third year of college that I made two major decisions. The first one was to apply to Columbia Law School instead of continuing at Barnard for my senior year. I hoped that a professional education might put me on the road to a career in politics. I wanted to change the world. First Lyle stockings and afterwards, you never know. Uh, the second decision was that I decided to marry Bill Zeck. This had a certain urgency since he was being drafted into the army. My parents were not pleased with the idea of my marrying, particularly since I was only 18 years old. However, they eventually consented, probably recognizing that the circumstances of the war and my own headstrongness made this necessary. I continued to live at my parents' New York apartment, and sometimes I visited my new husband for a weekend at a time in the various places where he was stationed. The law school was also in a very unsettled state, with some faculty members on leave to work in Washington, and a very odd year-round schedule because the law school wanted to accommodate students who might be drafted. 
I do not remember exactly, but my rough recollection is that there was something like 100 people in my class. Only six of them were women. The women, and of course Harvard wouldn't admit any women to the law school. Uh, the women were often treated as a strange category of persons who didn't belong in the law school. For example, in class, when called upon to present a case, all students were addressed as Mr. So-and-so. The teacher just had the list of the names. And <laughs> oh. If a woman stood up to present a case, there was general laughter in the classroom. Law school passed in a blur of wartime excitement and my itinerant marriage. I stayed in touch with my mentor, Max Lowenthal. And when it came time for me to find three lawyers to sponsor me for the bar in New York, I asked Max if he would do it, and he said yes. My last semester at, Wall, at, uh, at, my last semester at the law school, I began looking for jobs at large law firms in New York. There were very few firms that had any women attorneys on their staffs, and most of my interviews were dismal affairs with negative remarks about gender stitched into the conversation, like, when do you expect to have a baby? Uh, but there was one important exception. Spence Hotchkiss Parker and Durier, which was then a big Wall Street law firm. It had just made a woman a partner, which was extremely unusual. My favorite law school professor, Carl Llewellyn, had told me to apply to them, and they hired me. I spent a year at Spence Hotchkiss working for private clients, still living in my parents' apartment, still visiting my officer husband on weekends from time to time. But an unexpected turn of events changed everything about my ideas about my future. In 1945-46, during my year on Wall Street, World War II had come to an end. At that time, the international trial of the major German political figures mounted by American, Russian, French, and British prosecutors together was ongoing in Nuremberg. Subsequent trials were planned for other war criminals, ranging from Nazi doctors to German government, military, and industrial leaders. These subsequent trials were not to be mounted by an international group, but to be conducted by the Allied governments in charge of the, varied occup the various occupied zones of Germany. The person who became the chief prosecutor in the American zone was Brigadier General Telford Taylor. Taylor made a trip to the United States to recruit the new staff that was needed to replace the military service lawyers who would be coming home. See, his whole staff were military people. One of the people he consulted was my own old friend, Max Lowenthal, whom he had known years earlier when both were working for a congressional committee in Washington. In thinking about young lawyers, Lowenthal suggested that I might be a good candidate. So it was due to Max's speaking to Telford Taylor that I eventually came to be at Nuremberg. There are no accidents. <laughs> I asked my law firm for a leave of absence and they gave it to me. When I arrived at the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, I made an appointment with Telford Taylor. He showed me the list of contemplated prosecutions and asked me which case I wanted to work on. I chose the case against the industrialists. My reasoning was that they would be the most interesting because they probably had some choice about whether or not they would sponsor Hitler's projects. Taylor assigned me to the E. Gay Farben case. Farben was a major chemical company which not only had provided the gas for the final solution, but also employed captive labor in their factories. I was very pleased about the assignment. My immediate job at Nuremberg was to review and compile documentary evidence related to the Farben's potentially criminal activities. It was thrilling to be part of the internationally important Nuremberg activities, particularly when I was asked to travel to other military centers, such as Berlin, to find out whether there were any useful documentary files that might be in their custody. On one of these assignments, I went to Frankfurt the location of the headquarters of Farben. I was told that the records of the company had been stored in some salt mines to protect them from bombing during the war, but that they were then brought back to Frankfurt 
at the end of the war. When I got there, what I saw were several factory-sized warehouses full of papers, all neatly arranged in manila folders on hundreds of shelves on many floors. I was introduced to a very dignified German who had been in Farben's employ. He had been in charge of Farben's records for many years, and he had overseen their placement of the warehouses when they were brought back from the salt mines. He said he would be glad to help me in any way possible. I explained my mission, gathering evidence for the later prosecutions of Farben executives, and asked if the various kinds of records that I thought would be useful financial records, records of workers employed, and such. I asked in what order the documents had been shelved so I could set my assistants to work in productive areas. Oh, no, madam, I cannot help you there. I have no idea in what way these documents are arranged. <coughs> this seemed unlikely. He had had, a, <laughs> he had had a long career with the farm and company and was in charge of the delivery of the records to Frankfurt. I decided to make an appointment with the American army major who was in charge of the whole of the Farben complex. You must understand, here I am in an American oh. uniform, 22 years old, yes. So I go to see this major to see what's up. Uh, uh, he received me. He was in charge of the whole Farben complex. I explained what I was doing in Frankfurt and the kind of information I was looking for and the fact that the German custodian was not helpful. I thought this was treasonable. The major's response was to tell me, one, that he did not approve of the prosecution of the prominent political figures who were being on trial in Nuremberg. And second, that he certainly did not support the con contemplated prosecution of industrialists. He told me, moreover, that he had heard that there were Jews on the staff in Nuremberg. He made it clear that he would not help me in any way. I reported the discouraging result to tell for Taylor when I got back to Nuremberg. So the evolving anthropologist had now glimpsed some of the limits of what the law could do and how the agendas of individuals and organizations could circumvent the best laid plans of formal structure. Some months later, in 1947, I returned to the United States. My marriage was in tatters. I needed to obtain a divorce and to straighten out my life. Telford Taylor offered me a job in Washington, the Washington office that was associated with the trials. But I didn't want to be that far from the center of action for the prosecution, so I refused. <coughs> In 1948, after spending some time in Reno, Nevada, I got my divorce. <laughs> and I moved, I moved back in with my parents. <laughs> the law firm I had left welcomed me back, but I did not want to spend the rest of my life in private practice. I wanted to do something grander and to be part of the international world. Exposure to the excitement at Nuremberg the moral dilemmas and the political complexity had made private law practice seem gray in comparison. But what to do instead was not clear to me. I felt very uncertain of myself. I was also very much aware that my marriage had been a mistake, and I wanted to be more sure that my future choices would be better ones. My brother, Lee, who was by then a doctor, was in training with the intention of becoming a psychoanalyst. Psychoanalysis was being widely talked about in the circles in which I traveled. I thought that being psychoanalyzed might help me sort out some of the many choices I had to make about my per professional and personal life. I appealed to my parents, who very generously agreed to foot the bill, and I began a three-year analysis in the spring of 1948. In the professional world, I explored alternatives for my future. I consulted my Columbia law professors, and I talked with Max Lowenthal. I explained my dilemmas about work and asked for suggestions. We decided that an optimal solution was actually in New York. The UN, very conscious of its location in the United States and desiring an inter international reputation, had established a quota for the number of Americans that it would hire. 
didn't wish to be identified as an American institution. My mentors inquired into the hiring situation, and they told me my chances of getting a job were very good, but that it would take another year at least before a new quota for Americans opened up and that I should expect to wait. I decided to spend my year of waiting in an academic setting in which I could learn more about comparative political and legal organization. Along the way, I spoke with members of the anthropology faculty at Columbia and described my background as a lawyer. They were very welcoming and explained that there was very little work being done in law and anthropology and that there should be more. They suggested that I register for their graduate program. I did not have excuse me, any intention of shifting from law to anthropology at that time. But I thought that an exposure to anthropology would make for a very interesting year and would prepare me for the international arena. I applied to the Columbia Department. I had several months to wait before the academic year began. During that time, I had two exciting adventures, one political and the other one a matter of the heart. First, the political one. Max Lowenthal, my admired mentor, was working on a book about the FBI, and he needed someone to do library research for him. Lowenthal was a well-connected Washington insider. He thought that if he wrote a book about the misdeeds of J. Edgar Hoover as head of the FBI, the book would make it possible for President Truman to fire, <laughs> fire Hoover. Lowenthal had known Truman for many years, in fact, since 1935, and was familiar with his views. He was sure Truman would like the book and find, the, find this evidence very useful. Much of what Lowenthal knew about the illegal mismanagement of the FBI was privileged information that he could not publish. He felt that instead a strong case could be made if it were based on publicly available data. He asked me if I were willing to, be, to dig up this material in the library if he gave me the dates when it might have come out. I agreed to help with this project, but I was frightened that such an involvement might result in my being targeted by the FBI. This was the time of the House on American Activities Committee and all the hunting down of liberals. But the work sounded interesting, and I had some time. <laughs> I agreed to help on condition that I wouldn't be paid for the work and that my involvement would be completely off the record. I spent several months burrowing in the library for scandals. To jump ahead, sometime later when the book was finished, Max Lowenthal phoned me sounding very excited. He explained that he wanted me to come over so he could show me the galley proofs which he had sent to President Truman for his comments. Truman had inked his remarks in the margins. This is great. Whoa. <laughs> and other expressive words to that effect. <laughs> Max was delighted. He was sure the book went printed and with the support of Truman would have had the practical effect he expected and would help lift the country out of the dark days of Hoover's reign. A bit later in 1950, when the book was actually published, its politically explosive content was noted in the New York Times. A reporter that, from the Times then asked Truman what he thought of this book about the FBI. President Truman replied without hesitation, I've never heard of it. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> Hoover remained head of the FBI until 1972. This is in 1950. I had learned something about the politics of power. Now on to the adventure of the heart. In 1948, I decided to use the summer before I could start the Columbia Anthropology Program by visiting an anthropological research site in Haiti. I had heard from one of the Columbia professors that there was a study going on in Haiti under the leadership of Alfred Metro, a well-known French anthropologist. I wrote to him. He invited me to come to his outside, out, outpost in the Marbial Valley, where he was conducting research and training some Haitian students. Nothing could please me more. I also knew that before and after I visited Metro in Haiti, 
I could stay with a college friend, Edith Efron, who lived in Port-au-Prince. She had recently married a Haitian businessman much older than herself. She was his fifth wife and, <laughs> and had just had a baby son. I wanted to see Haiti, I wanted to see Edie and a baby. When I was staying in Edith's house, an American friend of hers, who had been in Haiti for a year and was soon leaving, dropped in to say goodbye to her. That tall, red-headed person with a gold earring was Crescent Moore. He was a Princeton dropout who'd been in Haiti living in a grass hut on the beach. <laughs> Good place to go from Princeton. <laughs> He was writing a novel at the time, and he was soon going to go back to the US to finish college at Columbia, hence the goodbye visit. He offered to show me a little of Haiti before he left. To skip to a much lighter part of the story, Cressip and I were married in 1951, <laughs> when we were both studying at Columbia. Our first daughter, Penelope, was born in New York in 1952, she's here. And that marriage lasted for 50 years until Cressup died in 2001. <clears throat> I greatly enjoyed my first year studying anthropology. And when at the end of the end of that year, the job at the UN that I had hoped for did not materialize, I decided at the age of 25 that a hybrid law and anthropology career might be very attractive. And I signed up for the, for the PhD program. A great deal of American anthropology at that time, including the work of many members of the Columbia Department, was concerned with living Native Americans of North and South America. And though my interest from the Nuremberg experience was in large polities and how they acquired their character, most of the ethnographic courses offered had to do with existing small-scale societies, such as the Hopi and the Navajo. But when I learned that there was much Spanish colonial material available on the no longer existent large-scale societies of the Inca and the Aztecs, I resolved to study the Inca legal system for my dissertation. I knew that library research, as opposed to field work, would allow me to meet the family obligations I undertook when I married Cressive, and I would not have to leave the family. Because Cressive was a historian of 19th century British politics, we spent a number of years in England for the purposes of his work. Family life continued along with his research in mine, and we had a second daughter, Nicola, born at home in London on December 30th, 1955. And when, when she arrived, my husband said, wonderful, she's a tax deduction. Thanks to a nursery school for Penny and occasional hours when the sitters for baby Nicola were available, I was able to continue working on my dissertation in England. Detailed study of income methods of taxation and structures of administration exposed much about the practical problems the Inca government encountered, both in ruling its own people and when it ruled other peoples that it conquered and incorporated into its domain. That a rudimentary state could, ruse, could rule a large population over a considerable geographical area was a considerable achievement. That it could do so without modern resources of communication and transportation was astonishing. The workings of the Inca organization called attention to political and legal questions that did not manifest themselves in the small scale field studies that were the more common intellectual project, product of the academic anthropology departments at that time. My next big step in learning to be an anthropologist, or to be the anthropologist I became, was first of all from contact with British social anthropology, and finally from doing real field work. The British academic approach was quite different from the American. A great deal of the British foundational field work was conducted in colonial societies in the first half of the 20th century. They were most interested in the pre-colonial native culture and trying to reconstruct from current practices how those cultures had operated. You know, what was your grandfather's habit? They also did not focus on the interactions between traditional social systems and the newly imposed colonial structure. It was, sometimes it was mentioned, but really rather by the way. 
From 1961 to 81, when Cressup and I were not in England, we lived and taught in California at UCLA and at USC. In fact, my British anthropology contacts began in California. I became close friends with two senior, well-known British trained anthropologists who were part of the UCLA anthropology department. They were Hilda Cooper and M.G. Smith. Both had done major field work in Africa, Cooper in Swaziland and Smith in Nigeria. Cooper and Smith became central figures in a lively African studies center at UCLA. With Ford Foundation funding, they invited a series of British social anthropologists with African experience to come to California to give papers at the center. It was an exciting time in Africa because all the countries were decolonizing at that moment. I found that the discussions at the Center for African Studies were the intellectually liveliest I had heard in years. You know, this shift of governance uh, is a real stimulus to the imagination. I would have liked to see for myself what was happening in Africa. However, though I'd read a lot of anthropological materials on African societies, I'd never done any field work. And I felt uncertain whether my family obligations would interfere with my doing so. But Hilda Cooper and Mike Smith persuaded me otherwise. It could be done, they assured me. I selected a location, I learned some basic Swahili, and applied for a grant. I got the grant and the die was cast. I set out for Africa in 1968-69 with the whole family in tow, a husband and my two daughters, who are now becoming teenagers. And they said to me, we would like to work for you. We would like to work for the Africans, but we really don't want to help you. We want to help them. <laughs> I plan to study the way of life and the living law among the Chaga, a large ethnic group that lived on Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Tanzania had recently become independent. The new African government had decided to turn the whole country into a socialist polity. As a practical matter, what did that mean? The Chaga were not a small local group. There were at least 700,000 of them at that time, and there are many, many, many more now. They spoke their own language, which is Kichaga, with the kin and neighbors. However, Swahili is the official language of the government, the courts, the schools, and all public business, so most Chaga also speak Swahili. There were substantial differences in wealth among the Chaga, usually depending on whether a family member had a salaried job or a grandfather had worked for a colonial government or was a chief in the old days. There were also substantial differences in educational level in the population. Most members of the Chaga people finished with elementary school and very few got to secondary school. Each Chaga family lived in a tiny self-built house without running water or electricity. They grew subsistence crops in the small plot of land surrounding the house. Where altitude permitted, this included a small grove of towering banana plants, which was their staple food, and included coffee bushes, which they cultivated as a cash crop. There were no villages in the European sense, just many little plots of land adjacent to one another all over the mountain. Law on, on Kilimanjaro was many layered. First of all, the Chaga had a traditional indigenous system of law of their own, which had been well documented by a learned missionary named Bruno Gutmann. He lived on the mountain for some decades, beginning in the 1890s. On top of their own customary system of Chaga law, the Chaga experienced a German colonial period from the late 1800s to the First World War, and a British colonial period from World War I to independence in 1961. Each colonial period brought many new laws and regulations, as did the new independent government. There were also missionaries who pressed their own rules and their own ideas on the Chaga, claiming the authority of God. The question for me was to learn about their present way of life and how they explained it all to themselves. In the beginning, I spent time in a tiny open court, an open air court, 
with rows of benches and a raised platform in front, where a magistrate with no legal training applied the law he knew. I heard, hired a young local man named Hawkins and DeSanjo, who had some English, to sit with me and explain the background so I could begin to understand what was actually going on when, they, when the witnesses were yelling at each other. We began work in the court, but soon Hawkins invited me to his own home, and there I met his family and neighbors and eventually learned a lot about local life and controversies. Over the years, I obtained many more informants from various other localities and broadened my reach. I did this work with variations for a few months at a time over a period of 20 years. One subject I studied was land use and ownership. In a, study of, in a society of subsistence farmers, land is a matter of death, life and death. I generally began by asking how an individual had acquired his own plot of land. After a time, I was able to find out how neighbors and kinsmen had obtained their plots, and I began to make maps and construct local genealogical histories. I paid attention to the local gossip. There was a general land shortage on Kilimanjaro. The population goes up, 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 despite AIDS and, and disease and everything else, and much disputing about who should inherit what and how the small plots should be subdivided. These land disputes generally do not go to the courts, but were negotiated at home among kinsmen. There was, for example, a particular relative of Hawkins who had been seriously ill for a year or more. The sick man attributed his illness to the malevolence of a nephew. He said the nephew had somehow caused supernatural forces to kill him. The sick man did not want the nephew to have anything more to do with him. He declared to his kinsmen that he would not allow the nephew to make any claim to his land or other assets, though the nephew would have been eligible to do so according to local customary law. The kinsmen sided with, sided with the sick man. Grievances, suspicions, and witchcraft anxieties festered for years and were simply part of long, local ongoing life. Sometimes individuals were chased out of the patrilineage never to be seen again. No one could ever be sure that he or she was safe from the suspicions and envy of others. The instance of the sick man and the nephew shows how the patrilineage had control over its members. It had its own internal rules and priorities. The formal legal system had nothing to do with it. Though my interest in formal legal systems continues, like many other law and society scholars, I've become increasingly focused on the non-legal orderings and political maneuverings that account for so much of social life. How did the new socialist government of Julius Nyerere figure in, this, in these family lives? The answer, not surprisingly, was extremely complex. One example will have to suffice. Very early in the life of the new state, Nyerere abolished all titles to land. Land suddenly belonged to all the people, not to particular individuals. Of course, in practice on Kilimanjaro, everyone continued to live in the same plots of land as before. But because land was not formally owned, legitimized by a title, in theory, land could not be sold. Nevertheless, with various legitimating subterfuges, occasional transfers of land for cash continued to occur. Disputes about these were addressed using a many-layered set of resources. There was the possibility of expulsion from the kinship group or the intervention of authority. There were the uses of official contacts, allusions to customary law, and to the formal laws of the national government, all overlapping and uh, operating in the same domains. And what can one possibly conclude from this? This double life, one ruled by the local social system and the other proclaimed by the government legal system, is found in almost all social settings. In every society and social subgroup, several normative area orders are in operation. Looking for these and describing them modifies one's understanding of the position and workings of the formal legal system. This concept has been the center of my life of learning throughout the years. 
Like Ms. Frindner, my dear governess, I've been able to travel the world. My interest in the micropolitics of my multicultural Upper East Side New York City apartment has developed into a life of trying to understand and explain how conflicts are resolved in other arenas. Although my work hasn't involved totem poles, I've spent a good deal of time in grass huts and studying the systems and structures that govern real lives. The limits of formal law that were suggested by my experience in Nuremberg and elsewhere turn out to be universal. Thank you very much.